I think my oldest building's from 1895. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Ashray Gupta. Ashray, how are you doing today? Good, Todd. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Ashray is from Encephalo Investments, and I'll let you just give your uh, brief kind of background, and then we'll dive in, get to get to the bread and butter. Perfect. Um, Todd, so background's pretty uh, traditional. I spent some time in finance. I was in corporate, um, did financial planning and analysis, a little bit of banking, a little bit of hedge fund work. Um, after I did that, moved in a commercial real estate for the Malax Band of Ojibwe, um, oversaw a portion of their portfolio, did a lot of analyst work. Um, early on in my corporate career, you know, I, I'm young, I'm 24. Um, I wanted to buy a house, uh, found a duplex in a really nice part of town um, for my girlfriend and I, uh, and bought that, realized we couldn't afford to pay our own rent if we were to, you know, <laughs> rent a unit. So stuck it on rent. Girlfriend wasn't super happy with it, but, you know, she understood. Um, and the light bulb sort of clicked or turned on. And, you know, three years later, uh, the portfolio was 104 units. Um, slowly growing, steadily growing. Um, and I do this full time now. And it's probably been the most, like, exciting and exhausting few years of my life. And I would not trade it for anything else. What kind of, when you say, um, did you say 140? Is that what I heard? 104. 104. 104 yep. units. What What do you, like, what's the makeup of those? Yeah, so it's all multifamily. It's all, you know, what I would call lower income class C housing um, in ungentrified parts of town where Are I don't think. Like the duplexes, fourplexes, or, or bigger stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a mix. You know, I would say, uh, what is it? We have two single family houses, a duplex, triplex, a six unit, two nine units. Um, we have uh, five 11 units that are part of the, the same complex. Um, so that's that's the makeup. Um, and moving forward, I'm really looking at five to 20 unit buildings airing on the upper side of that range, call it 12 to 20 units. Um, 80% of our units were built and probably 70% of the units were built between call it 1955 and 1970. Um, we do have some older buildings, uh, turn of the century buildings, like call them, I think my oldest buildings from 1895. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, What's I have the a challenge a, of an 1895 building. If you think about it, you know, whether it was homeowners or investors, um, the average tenure of ownership is probably eight to 10 years on a building like that, right? Um, and, and as we get more modern, it gets more compressed, shorter ownership periods. Um, and if you just think about it, like a, you open a wall, it's like peeling an onion, right? Like there's so many different layers of work that have been done and pieced together that if something goes wrong um, or, you know, there's an issue with the building, you have to, uh, you're peeling that onion to figure out, okay, what, where is the actual issue? Hmm. Um, there's, you know, so many different variations of like code that have happened um, and people doing, you know, permitted work, unpermitted work over a hundred and what is that? 25 years. Yeah. Um, you know, it, the nice thing is, those buildings sometimes feel like they were built better than, you know, my 60s, 70 builds. Um, the units are smaller. Uh, but honestly, I, I really like them. It feels like a, a market a lot of investors uh, pass over because, sure, they're, they're a lot more CapEx heavy, um, a lot more maintenance heavy. And they're typically in really tough parts of town. But we go in with the assumption that, you know, if we're buying it for a hundred grand, we're putting 50 grand back into it. Um, but typically you do that and these things are worth 300 grand, 400 grand when you're done. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, they they come with their those old old buildings come with their own set of challenges. I think the biggest thing you've got to look for, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that 125 year old building. It could be the 25 40 no, probably like 40 year old building, right? Um, but you got to look for like what kind of uses people or what kind of layouts do people want in their apartments? So, so I had a, a building, I think it was built in like 1906, nice part of town, brick four square. But the problem with it, it was a high demand area. We always got it rented, but the biggest problem with these, that building was the closets were literally uh, as wide. I think like you could maybe fit a shoe in there, right? It, it barely, you couldn't hang it anything in there there was literally coat hangers but so you 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 want to hang your clothes you had to get a rod outside of the closet to hang your clothes you couldn't so that was the biggest issue always with that is people would be like oh i really like this This is such a great place but it's got no closet and we couldn't really build a closet because it was their small units so that, that you always have to look at what's what are some maybe things that weren't a big deal back then but are a big deal now and i think that's really important when you're looking at those buildings and of course the other thing you already mentioned is like yeah repairs you got to peel back the onion you got to figure out okay what's going on here you just have to understand it's going to be more repairs and maintenance uh issues with those buildings i'm sure you get the same thing on these 60s and 70s built i mean the plumbing systems and electrical systems are still really old and so that's always a big issue yeah we um we're, we're having some issues, you know, on a, on a building with lead waste traps and, you know, we're, we, we didn't go into the building expecting that. Um, but fortunately we, we had enough in reserves to sort of go through, start doing, you know, uh, replacements. We're not doing repairs. We, we figure if we're going to open up the walls, um, might as well just do it once and be done with it. We know that, you know, on a rental basis, we're not going to get a return on yield or a return on cost. Yeah. Um, but I, I've never really approached, you know, non-visible CapEx from the, you know, lens of, am I going to get a higher rate? It's, you know, am I going to remove a headache for myself? I, you know, I I try to buy these buildings, right? It's like, if I'm going to own this for the next 10 years, I want to do all the work now while I'm called like excited about the building. Um, so that for the uh, nine years after the first year of work, it's on autopilot. You know, I'm not thinking about it. My property manager is showing up, doing his thing. Um, and maybe I get a call every couple months of like, hey, we should do this. We should do that. And I'm like, all right, um, might as well do it. Um, I, I'm always putting money back into the buildings. Um, you know, we we don't really budget a dollar per unit in the traditional sense. I My maintenance manager, every time we buy a building, he goes through and we have like effectively a depreciation schedule on everything, you know, fridges, uh, stoves, windows, the roof, plumbing, shutoffs, um, anything and everything in a unit that needs to get replaced over the next 10 years. And we basically look at, you know, um, what's the replacement cost going to be at the end of its usable life, break that up over. um, He's gotten pretty good at estimating, you know, Oh, this stove looks like it has three years left or five years. You know, it's, it's as you do more of these, you get pretty comfortable at guessing that. And we say, okay, a new stove's four hundred and fifty bucks. We think we got three years left on this one. Well, let's save whatever four fifty divided by thirty six is each month. But the next fridge is eight years. Do the same thing, and then every month we're saving, you know, that aggregate dollar. Um, and we just bank it, you know, and that's sort of how we build up our reserves, um, because something's always going out. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, And then you never feel like you're coming out of pocket. Um, It's part of your, you know, OPEX. And we we record it like an OPEX line. Um, To me, it's, you know, it's it's way more conservative. On paper, my net cash flow looks lower than it really is. But I'm fine with that way. You know, I'd rather live off of call it 70% of my true dollar than, you know, go dollar for dollar and then be coming out of pocket for a fridge or a stove or a window when it actually has to happen. Yeah. That, and that's the key, right? If you're, 
you're living on 70% or, or maybe it's even less, but you're living on 70% of your real dollar. Now you've got reserves. And if things happen, you don't have a lifestyle that's used to being able, used to living off of a hundred percent. Now you can only live off of 50% for a while because yep. you weren't being frugal with how you're, how you were actually managing your budget and your CapEx. And that, that hidden CapEx is the worst, right? Because it is something that it doesn't add value. Like you can't replace a roof and tell the residents that, Hey, you know, the roof's brand new. Guess what? You know, your rent's going up. It's like, that doesn't work. They don't care. Nope. The, the roof should be new in their opinion. Like that's just something that happens. It's not like you replaced cabinets or repainted the unit or, you know, did did new flooring or things like that. Those things, those big ticket items usually don't add any value. And even if it maybe adds a little bit, but the, the tenant doesn't pay for it, right? They they don't they don't say, oh, this building has new windows. I'm excited now. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay more for rent. That just they don't see that. Like they don't that doesn't translate. Right. It's, it's totally, you know, what we have retiling seen retiling a bathroom. Yeah, exactly. Well, we have seen my property manager, he, he sells people on those improvements in a way of, you know, look, I, I work for the building owner. Um, I don't really understand how he thinks, but what I can tell you is he pays attention to the things you don't care about. Um, you know, he, he tells people, yeah, he, he just did the roof. He just did the windows. And then he flips and he goes, you know, if he's willing to spend money on stuff like that, imagine what he's going to do when you have a problem with your unit. You know, he's going to have somebody there and make sure it's taken care of. And we've noticed, you know, we're, we're filling units, you know, at or above market rate in a couple of days. And, and the consistent feedback that my property manager gets is, you know, it looks like he's an active owner. Yeah. Um, Cause a lot that. of people, Exactly. Especially um, if you're talking uh, C class neighborhood too, C C C or or B plus or, or sorry B minus, they care about that because they're so used to seeing so many places and they've lived in places where the the owner doesn't do anything. And so if you do have a building that's been taken care of, again, it might not get you a ton more rent, but it's going to keep your residents there longer. It's going to probably help you lease the property quicker. Yeah, it, it shows a lot of goodwill to the prospective tenants and current tenants. Yeah, we um, took a building offline and it took us three months to, you know, basically take this building down the studs, rebuild it back up. Um, and we finished the units, let's call it June 1. And we were 60% leased out by June 10. It was incredible. I have not seen that sort of leasing velocity. Um, and we were probably at the 90th percentile for rents in that neighborhood. Um, but we were the nicest building on the block. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the biggest things, you know, starting out, people told me were like, don't over improve your buildings. Um, I tried to agree with that philosophy, but my biggest thing kept coming back to is, you know, would I move my parents into this unit? And I couldn't get myself to say yes until they were over improved. Um, and to me, it's, you know, why just because it's a C-class neighborhood, why shouldn't they have soft closed cabinets? Right? right. Why shouldn't they have, you know, um, actual life proof flooring instead of, you know, the 99 cent um, knockoff. Um, treat people like they're people and they'll treat your property like it's theirs, you know, treat them like they're, you know, a name or a number on a rent roll and they'll treat your property like a rental. Yeah. I love that philosophy right there. It's so many people. And by the way, why landlords, property owners get such a bad name and social media is allowing that to expand like wildfire is the landlord that treats their tenants like they're a number. And, and and they don't really care. It's just another dollar sign. Each tenant is a dollar sign and that's it. Well, you treat them like that and they're not going to treat you well, but you treat them like they matter, right? Well, my, my thought is, and it's very similar, obviously it's similar to what you're th talking about is, is like, could my parents live here is these people are paying a good portion of their income to live in my property. 
Like they're paying a lot of money to live here. I need to make sure I take care of them. Like that yep. is my responsibility. My responsibility is to provide them an excellent place to live. Their responsibility is to pay me. Right. And that's the give and take that we have to have. It's the landlord that decides that that's not the case that, Hey, these slummy people, I'm just going to charge them and I don't need to take care of them. That's where the bad name comes in really quickly. And then again, with social media, man, it just spreads like wildfire and everybody is assumed to be bad like that. Yeah. I, you know, when I got into this, I sort of expected my tenants to hate me just because, you know, that's what you see on social media and they'd be like, Oh, you're the landlord. Um, I, I still remember the first time I was potentially going to sell a building and my tenant in that building, he calls me and he goes, Hey, I saw you're thinking about, you know, because we, we had the agent come through this and that. Um, and he goes, if you sell the building, can you let me know if you have a vacancy elsewhere? Because I don't want to lose you as a landlord. And that was the craziest feeling. I was like, okay, I'm doing something right. You know, I, I am a landlord that people want to stay with, you know, they, they care about the experience we've created and curated much more than necessarily, you know, where they live. Um, one of the things that um, we track is how quickly does our maintenance team get to maintenance calls? And it's like 87% of our maintenance calls are solved within 24 hours. Um, That's huge. And realistically that actually means you know by the end of the same business day i mean yeah. man how often do you fix something in your own house by the end of the same day like almost never right it's like okay i'll do it on the weekend right or you know i'm tired tonight i will you know take care of that tomorrow you know a, you know a, an art piece falls down like oh I'll, I'll put it aside i'll you know stick it back up this weekend yeah no we're, we're out there the same day and sure yeah you're paying a little bit of a premium to live here but that's what that enables right um our Maintenance we're not is the number one reason why people move out yep exactly um we we try to be technology first right you know um we're we're not unique in the sense you know we use buildium but we we've enabled most of the tech features right you can text our maintenance stack you can email us submit pictures um our our website is you know pretty modern um it it's fluid um we, we live in a digital world right like the the days of physical checks and you know phone <laughs> calls are sort of gone. Long gone um yeah uh you know we we try our best to avoid tenants paying via you know venmo and apple pay cash and stuff but you know, we still have some people where that's the easiest thing um we we serve a lot of fresh immigrants who are coming from countries where their banking system is so corrupt and so volatile that they don't believe in bank accounts. You know, we are, we're one of the few uh, landlords locally that still do cash payments. Um, but that's because, you know, my property manager comes from that sort of, you know, background and culture. He understands, you know, this, this isn't a red flag. These are people that are coming from, you know, a diverse background and, and we make sure, you know, we, we embrace that. Um, we, I'm on the board of a, a, a daytime homeless shelter in, um, in one of the neighborhoods where, you know, a heavy concentration of my buildings are, um, because if I can help, you know, in effect, clean up the streets, I I'm doing twofold, you know, I'm bettering the community, but I'm also bettering the neighborhood for my properties. You know, people slowly will want to live there and it's not an overnight thing. You know, these are, these are things you're putting into play today that'll come into fruition 10 years from now but that's the whole name of the game right this is a this is a 10 20 year investment this isn't a 10 or 20 month investment right right why um why c class versus b versus a what what's the reasoning that you got into it and are you staying in, I guess? And then and if so, is what's the reasoning that you like C-Class? So my first transaction was, you know, what I would call uh, a C product in an A market um, that I brought up to an A product. Um, great experience, but the market demands for what I had to do 
were frustrating. You know, you in C class product, you really get the opportunity to create an experience. You know, you there's not a lot of market comps for you know what is an improved product. So you get to create the story. You get to create the nice product. Um, you get to be a neighborhood leader. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of these C-class buildings are in neighborhoods that, you know, have had a very tumultuous, you know, whether it's past few years or, you know, longer. Um, and you get to be the person that comes in and really turns it around. I have a neighborhood where um, my the building I bought got shot up 11 times in 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, since I bought it, there's been zero gang activity, zero squatters. There have been no police calls on that block since I bought the building. I kicked everybody out. You know, it it had to be done. It's one of those things where, you know, sure, somebody's going to listen to this and say, you kick people out. Yeah. You know, they were hustling drugs out of the building. There was prostitution going on. Um, By the way, my listeners are not going to do that. They're going to go, wow, that's the right thing to do. (laughs) <laughs> I've had people reach. I've never, I, I've never talked to the neighbors type of thing. Right. Yeah. And they've reached out when I was like on site and genuinely said, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, you know, they have little kids, you know, they, I, I met one of these, uh, one of these neighbors, uh, two year old and four year old. And he's like, yeah, I let them play in the front yard now because before they couldn't, they had to play in the backyard. That was the only place that was like safe. Right. And I was just like, and he was like, that's because you cleaned the street up. And I was like, oh man, that's, that's a weird feeling. Like that feels really good, but like, whoa, like reality. But you have um, to take that stance. If you're going to buy C class and even it be, and sometimes even in an, a neighborhood. Um, and if you have a property with that reputation, you have to be prepared financially and emotionally to remove potentially all of the residents is just how it has to be. And that can be a huge financial drain and emotional drain. If that's a big property, if it's a duplex, no big deal, right? If it's a 40 unit building or even think bigger, I mean, boy, that's a lot of people you got to somehow move out, but it's the right thing to do at times. It just has to happen. And maybe it's not everybody, but it's a good portion of the people. Um, Yep. It, unless you want to keep the crime and keep those shootings. I mean, man, that's a lot of activity happening. Yeah. I don't, I wouldn't want nothing to do with keeping that type of tenant base. <laughs> nope. I'll tell you, man, St. Paul, uh, the, the, the inspectors and St. Paul PD, they, they know me on a first name basis and for good reasons, you know, um, typically when we, when we buy a building, you know, there, there's going to be scenarios where they're showing up. It's just unavoidable. You know, it's not like you close on a Monday and Tuesday tenants are gone. It takes a couple months to really make a story happen. Um, but w- when it happens and they get called, I show up. My property manager doesn't. I show up. And the first time I did that, they were like, "Oh, are you the property manager?" I was like, "No, I'm the owner." And they were shocked. They were like, "The owner doesn't show up." And I was like, "No, I, I show up." Um, and now when they get called to a building and I show up, they're like, "Okay, cool." Like they get excited, right? They're like, "Yeah, there's a problem here today." but we know we're not going to be here six months from now. Like we're done, right? I'm making their lives easier. Um, And then candidly speaking, you know, there's crazy stupid yield on these buildings. Um, You know, I, I bought some stuff last year for 54 a door, uh, 54,000 a unit. And today they're worth 130, I'm 130,000 a unit. Um, I'm sure, you know, with the market dynamics, valuation has gone down a bit. But 130,000 units at a seven and a seven five six cap, um, in a C class neighborhood, you know, seven and a half cap on C class multifamily is still a decently high cap rate. Yeah. Sure. Um, even if I say nine cap, which you know, is kind of unheard of, especially in our market, these things are still well over 110 a door, right? Um. Uh, that's you know in in a year how did you find a deal like that at 55 a door when everything else is going for you know 85 to 130 a door you know it i was on vacation in arizona i was i think in scottsdale or something oh so you're really Um, working hard you're just on vacation yeah exactly right and i was uh we were doing some sort of like uh whatever like one of those like jeep tours and i saw like on my watch and it was just like east st paul like i just got an email right uh i guess it was, it was on some wholesalers list. 
No, it was a uh, direct from owner. Direct from um, I don't know how he got my email because um, I never talked to the guy. Um, but I saw that and I was just like, that doesn't make sense. I'm sure it's a typo, right? And I just emailed him back like immediately while I'm on this tour in Arizona right now. We'll be back Monday. Can we set up time? Um, and he goes, sure. Monday I show up and I was just like, by the way, was this a typo? And he's like, no, I, I need to get out of these, you know. Uh, they're the smallest things in my portfolio. They're a pain to manage. Um, you know, they're, they're the buildings are rough, man. I mean, OSB instead of doors type of rough, right? right? Um, and just we tried to be as quick as possible, and then rent control happened. Mm -hmm. Um, so what should have been a forty-five day close took nine months. Um, but I, you know, made made sure to you know make him understand like this is out of my control yeah but i'm gonna make this happen like it, tom hell or high water we're closing on this thing i want to steal a lot of assurances um and you know just just confidence almost like we're gonna make this happen are are most of the deals are you typically trying to get these off market uh direct to owner or are you going typically through a broker I, I I hear a lot. It's funny because I hear a lot of people are like, "Yeah, oh, you can't buy apartments direct to owner. You got to go with the broker. The broker controls the the market." And I would say, "Hey, the broker definitely controls the market for sure." But are you sure that you can't go direct to owner? I hear from you. You just went direct to owner. I'm, I'm yeah. curious if you've done that before. I have. Um, I, I I go. I'm not one of those people that says, you know, I won't use a broker. Um. It just, if the deal makes sense, the deal makes sense. Um, I do a lot of, you know, I, I really don't like the term drive for dollars. It's just been so like, almost like commoditized. Um, but I just, you know, let's say my girlfriend and I, you know, we're going out to dinner Friday night. Um, she enjoys it also. We'll just drive up and down some streets and just look at, you know, who hasn't power washed their building in a while, who hasn't, you know, replaced yeah. an awning, who has broken windows. Um, and it's pretty easy to, you know, find out who owns the building. Um, especially in markets like this, you know, there's like a half dozen to a dozen of us that own most of the stuff. And then there's smaller, it's, it's like a pyramid, right? Um, 60, 70% of the buildings are owned by, you know, a handful of people and so on and so forth. And reputation matters, right? Like I, I don't retrain. That's one, that's a big thing. You know, I'm a pain in the ass on the front end of the deal. You know, Todd, if, if I'm ever going to buy a deal from you, we're going to, I negotiate hard up front with the certainty that the moment we ink that PA, I'm done. You know, because uh, in, in your mind, once you get the PA signed, you've sold the building, right? I know don't count your chickens until they hatch and so on and so forth, but you've sold the building. You have a price in your mind now. You're figuring out what to do next. And I'm not going to be the guy 30 days in saying, actually, no. right? Like, so that reputation is important. We do due diligence quick. And if we're going to back out of a deal, it's typically within 48 to 72 hours, right? We have people out there. They walk all the units, every single unit, um, get up on the roof, you know, run lines through the sewer uh, or through the plumbing um, scopes, so on and so forth. Um, and we make a decision quick. And if we back out, I'm not just sending you a, we're not interested anymore. It's I, I write it out. Even if this you don't care, I write it out. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. Um, reputation matters. A lot of people yeah. say that. I didn't understand that getting started. Um, I, I should say it's not that I was like, oh, reputation doesn't matter. I didn't understand what people meant by reputation. Um, and I, you know, for me, this is what reputation means, right? Like for me, it's I won't retrain. We're quick on due diligence. You know, I'm transparent. If, if something's not checking out, I tell you why not. Maybe there's something I don't see. Um, you know, if you've owned the building for 10 years and I walk in and I'm like, oh, your plumbing's weird, blah, blah, blah. 24 hours in a building, I'll never know the story. Maybe you've done something on purpose, right? I ask a lot of questions. Um, yeah, but that typically gets me really interesting deals. You know, my average purchase price per unit is $70,600 in a market where, you know, the average sale price for the last like five years was like 110. Right. Um, well, 55 door is going to help. Yeah. Um, 
Asher, what's a, what's a mistake that you've made um, through this process? What's a mistake that you can pass down to our listeners? How can they learn from it? I do a lot of construction heavy deals. Um, and I think the biggest mistake I made are two sides of the same coin. Vet your contractors <laughs> really hard. Yeah. Um, you know, reference checks, ask for bank statements, yeah. you know, make sure, you know, you're, you're verifying stuff with licensures. You know, the more you do it, um, you'll, you'll start to make friends with inspectors, call the inspectors, mm-hmm. right. Um, figure out, you know, what have they seen on other projects? Um, getting started, you know, a lot of people say I GC my first project and, you know, I saved a lot of money early on, get somebody else. It, the money you'll save, you're going to lose in time. But after you do it a couple of times, um, do it yourself. Um, it, it, not only is it you're, you have control over every lever, but if you're doing meaty construction projects, you can still, you know, stand up your own construction entity, still bill yourself a developer fee or a GC fee. You know, all it, I run all my construction through my credit cards. So all my travel is, you know, free. Um, but then also the rebates, Home Depot, Menards, the 11%, that's money back into your pocket, right? Um, so where, you know, let's call it dollar for dollar, what I used to do construction for, I'm able to do 70 cents of the dollar now. Um, stuff becomes a lot more accessible. And I wish I'd done that sooner. I was just a lot quicker too. Yep, exactly. I was scared. And I was very scared. I was like, I don't, I don't understand construction. You know, I'm never going to understand it as I'm an Excel guy. Um, so the other thing I guess is I didn't, I didn't build a team of people that know what they're doing, you know, way more than I do quick enough. Um, and now it's like what that, uh, I think Bill Gates said it, right? Like uh, a good leader hires people that are like at his level and a great leader hires people that are like way smarter than him. Yeah. And my entire team is filled with people that are way smarter than me um, at their specific role. Um, and, and that's what I think is allowing us to be really successful. Yeah. Love that. Love that. If you can find people at the specific role that are a way smarter and way more motivated than you too. That's one, that one thing like, you know, like my, I hate doing the books, like the tedious books. My bookkeeper loves it. Like she loves doing it. I don't love it at all now. And she does, she's way better at it than me too, but that's something that I would push off as long as I could. Right. And it would get so far behind because I don't enjoy it at all. Yeah. And now that I've got a bookkeeper, which I've had for a long time, but man, it's amazing. And so if you got, you got people that enjoy doing what you, that task and that are better at it, that's huge. Yeah, I am the same. I enjoy the chase. I enjoy finding the deal. I enjoy negotiating the deal, negotiating with banks, getting all the ducks in a row and closing it. And we're really building the business to a point now where, you know, I I go to our title company, close, get the keys, and I can drop them off. And now my team goes and executes the project, right? Yeah. That's where, and it's not like, oh, I don't want to work. Yeah. Um, I don't enjoy that part of the work i enjoy you want to find the next the deal. nuances of setting up exactly continue to grow and that's where the business. best yield is for the team exactly um and that's sort of you know uh one of the biggest things for me is like at this point i'm responsible for putting food on the table for 50 60 70 people whether it's construction or on the corporate side right um and if i'm not constantly looking at what's next what's next what's next i i have an obligation to these people and their kids, their families, so on and so forth, to make sure that we're always making money so that they yeah. can do the things they're passionate about. Yeah, I, I love that thought, that philosophy. All right, I got a couple last questions and I want to wrap up. What is a favorite book that you can pass down to our listeners? Compound Effect, Darren Hardy. Um, phenomenal book. You know, 1% a day is Super all simple, you need to do. Right? But just like you need that reminder. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think I read that for the first time when I was 16 and it doesn't matter what the 1% is and it it doesn't have to be the same thing every day, but just do something every day to be a little better. Love that. 
Um, what are what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, smart leverage. Hmm. Um, distressed assets. And how do I say this? Uh, a very successful but small tight knit team. Um, if you really want to, you know, go from you know a generation's worth of wealth to generational wealth, you need to be looking at assets like you know very distressed stuff that you can turn into bars of gold. You need to know how to be prudently levered, not just levered, but like, what does that mean? And you need to make sure that, you know, as early on as possible, you're building a team around you that shares the vision of, of what you want to do. Um, Cause that's the only way you grow. You can't do this yourself. You know, if you want to, what's, there's a saying, right. You want to go forward or you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together, something like that. Um, that's really important. Yeah, you can certainly do this alone, but you're going to hit just, you're going to hit a wall, right? You're going to get only so far and it's not 104 units. That's, that's way beyond, <laughs> right? If you're going to try to go alone, you're going to get a few properties under your belt and you're going to be, you're going to hate it by the way. And it's just going to be not efficient. If you start to hire that team, and I like that you like you don't need to go too big, right? It can be a small, tight knit team. It needs to be a team that understands you and your vision and what what the needs are. You need to be careful about it. But um, yeah, I love that. And uh, smart. What do you mean by smart leverage? What does smart leverage mean? A lot of times, you know, I hear people only get concerned about the rate, right? How do I get my rate down? How do I get my rate down? Um, but all they all they look at is seventy five percent loan to value, eighty percent loan to value, and I'm like, man, yeah, I know that cash is the restricting factor, but maybe you don't need to do the biggest deal you can do, go smaller, and maybe you know, take lower leverage. You know, look at what's going on in the world around you, and lever in accordance to that. Sometimes, you know, three years ago, money was free, effectively it was free, and at that point, max out your leverage. You know. It doesn't matter what you're borrowing, just borrow. Um, and you need to understand, a, a, a mistake I think a lot of people make is they don't understand how bonds work. They don't understand the conceptuals around what bonds are. Um, and if you wanna go from, you know, let's call it again, generation, uh, generations worth of wealth to generational wealth, you need to understand M2. You need to understand money supply. You need to understand, you know, the blood of the world. With, or the blood of the economy and that is how money flows um if you want to you know play in that next year yeah absolutely yeah i like the you know a lot of people will do that 75 80 percent leverage that's what they want to get now i'm being conservative and it's like well are you sure just because you got 75 percent you know so you got 25 percent sitting there in equity that means nothing if your debt service coverage ratio is yep. 1.1 1. 1 or, you know, exactly. bar barely making debt payments or, or maybe you're not making debt payments. So, so yeah, leverage can be a, a, an amazing tool, but a, you're right on smart leverage is, is where it's really all about. Uh, Ashray, what, any other last uh, advice for our listeners? If not, um, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Um, uh, the last piece of advice I want to give people is, you know, being patient is, you know, the hardest thing in the world. And it's also the most important. You know, a lot of people say best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. Second best time is now. That's not always true. Um, if you are trying to cut your teeth in today's environment, man, you got to have some really deep pockets and you got to be willing to take some really big risks. And sometimes sitting on the sideline is actually where you make your money. Um, patience rewards those who are patient. 
um to get in touch with me uh man i would just say you know uh reach out to me uh via email um emails ashray at encephalo investments it's a mouthful i try to get at encephalo but it's owned by some dentist in illinois they retired like a decade ago and they want eight grand for the domain and i'm too cheap to pay them eight grand for <laughs> yeah, the domain. i would be the same way we can yeah. we'll put that in our show notes so people can just click on it you don't have to try to like type it all in we'll, yeah we'll be right there on the in the show notes yeah man it, yeah. look Really appreciate the time and and uh, advice and uh, just to add on to that last one of being patient. Uh, you're right. So many people think oh, it's you got to buy now. You don't have to buy now. You are a hundred percent right. Sometime the best time or the best decision is to not buy, and that sometime will make you more money or at least not lose you money. Um, you know, you just, you got to be patient. You got to get deals that work for you and you have to make sure you're setting yourself up for success. And so I love, love that uh, piece of advice and really appreciate it. Um, you have a fantastic rest of the day, man. Appreciate it, Todd. You too. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. It's a rating and review. Just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to venturedproperties.com, venturedproperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like, uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out. And, uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.